Hey everybody, Coach Jonathan here. Before we get into today's episode, I have a very special announcement for all of you. Today we have launched a free trial here at Trainer Road. What that means is that anybody gets to try Trainer Road free for seven days. And you can try absolutely everything within the Trainer Road system. So that means, yes, you can even try adapted training free, totally obligation free and free of cost for seven days. Don't have to enter your credit card info, anything else. You can go over to trainerroad.com and sign up right now. Give adaptive training a try for free. It's super exciting. And all the other features, calendar, training plans, all that stuff. So go check it out. Go to trainerroad.com. Go sign up. And please tell all your friends who have been on the fence and maybe you've wanted to suggest or maybe even thinking about Trainer Road but haven't jumped on yet. Go tell them now because they can do it free of cost for the free with the free trial. So thanks, everybody. And without further ado, let's get to this episode. Welcome to the podcast is dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The ask a cycling coach podcast presented by trainer road. I'm joined by our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hey everybody. And also, uh, oh gosh, I swear it's a mental thing. I crack on this every time hand up. Plus the black bibs racing's Ivy Audrain. Nice. You got it. It's funny. I that got it this time. <laughs> yeah. As soon as you started <laughs> like speaking, I almost laughed. Cause I was like, Oh no, we didn't. We didn't do the team name review. He's going to mess it up. <laughs> you know, it's like one of those things that you can absolutely do it, but you have so much anxiety about messing up over that <laughs> one thing that you just screw yourself up every time and that that's it. But I'm glad I nailed it. It's exciting yeah. because you're getting ready for cyclocross racing. It's starting. Yeah. I'm flying out to a little UCI block tomorrow morning, going to go cross in Roanoke, Virginia, and then up to Rochester, New York, and then over to Charm City, in Baltimore. Try to get some points, baby. <laughs> That's exciting. Uh, if you're at those races and you see Ivy, high fives, hand ups, they're mandatory. So uh, make sure they are given. <laughs> uh, I want to mention our Successful Athletes podcast really quick. We had such a cool episode with Angela Chang. She's uh, uh, she's a mother. She's a career professional. And she managed to use or she used Trainer Road to train for the BC Epic 1000. It's a long race that goes across British Columbia, 640 miles, 1000 kilometers, goes across the interior of BC in like super rough terrain. Um, she did it took her seven days and she has so much grit. And she pushed through the whole thing. And it's just such a cool episode. So uh, check that out. That's the Successful Athletes podcast. And there's a link down below in the description on the YouTube video if you're joining us there. And on the podcast app that you're listening to that you can access the Successful Athletes podcast. You can also just search it on any podcast platform and you'll find it there. And then next week, um, I believe it'll be next week. uh, And actually, I'm probably getting ahead of myself on this one. Um, and getting everything out of order. Um, but we talk with a a gentleman named James Dunleap and James discuss, uh, discusses all about how cycling and endurance sport and mental health and the intersection that was causing a whole lot of issues for him, um, with a binge eating disorder and how he ended up really kind of using endurance sport to be able to manage this in a healthy way because he loves, uh, endurance sport and how he's managed to get through a lot of that. It's just a fantastic episode. I just butchered all of that, but James, uh, speaks very eloquently to the, his experience and describes it very well. And I found it very inspiring. It's a fantastic episode. So stay tuned for that on the successful athletes podcast as well. Adaptive training is now in free or sorry, in (laughs) an open beta, which basically means that it's not closed anymore and you don't have to wait to get access to it. Anybody that has a trainer road account, you can go into your account on trainer road, early access and flip that switch over on adaptive training to be able to get that, uh, start using it now. Super exciting. Uh, it's making constant improvements as we're training our machine learning and the overall, the, the feedback is overwhelmingly positive. People are getting really high quality training. It's really exciting. Also, One more thing to add to this. It's a big change for us here at Trainer Road. We now have a free trial. So that means you can use Trainer Road free for seven days. If you have not yet signed up, you can give it a shot and see what it work what it works like. And you can also try adaptive training in that seven day period. So you get to try all of this for free, which is really exciting. Um, we've long had a 30 day money back guarantee, which we stood behind. Um, but you still had to go through the hoops of entering your payment information and you felt like you just kind of jumped right into it. So we want the, uh, we wanted to make it more accessible for all people. So give it a shot, give it a try for seven days, go over to trainerroad.com and sign up for the free trial. Exciting times. Uh, Chad, we are going to talk about, uh, this week, we're going to talk about cross training, 
We're going to talk a little bit about muscular endurance too, and some stuff in some of like the user or the listener questions. We also have a ton of fun rapid fire uh, stuff. Uh, what and, say, and I am we... here to uh, listen to Chad's deep dives and say yes, yeah, agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, these, these have some good ones with, with relevant content. That's why you're on here, Ivy. Um, uh, so it's going to be great. Uh, Tobias, uh, let's get into his question. He says. Hey, all, thanks for the amazing weekly content. I'm learning so much since w- swapping out music for the podcast on my daily commutes. I used to be an avid cyclist, did Liège best on Liège, but nothing on uh, nothing but junk miles in 2012, but have since lost all cycling strength and gained about 90 pounds. I bought a trainer and got a trainer road subscription late last year, and I'm slowly getting back into it because of some cycling and triathlon related goals I've had on my bucket list for years. And watching all those neat little graphs show up while cycling is a massive part of my motivation at the moment. So my question is about training while being overweight and or losing weight. Since a higher body weight is associated with a higher FTP, does that mean that once I start losing weight, I can expect my FTP to drop as well? And if so, how do I adjust my training plan with that in mind? With the workout seemingly getting harder week uh, week over week, even without updating my FTP through a ramp test, I worry that I'll be at a point soon where I won't be able to finish the workouts or where workouts might not be the most productive they can be due to a shift in where the different zones are as a result of him losing weight, he's saying, and possibly dropping his FTP. And then he uh, closes out by saying, see you on the Successful Athletes podcast in a year or two when I've shattered all my goals, thanks to all of you. (laughs) Much love from the Netherlands. Yes, uh, that's a date, Tobias. I'll be ready on Zoom just waiting for you the whole time. So uh, looking forward to it. Chad, this is uh, uh, where, where do you want to start with this one? Well, first off, let me turn it over to you because everything he just described there in terms of his concerns with how the training adapts is basically the inspiration behind adaptive training. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you get to that point where you feel like, oh, I'm worried that the workouts are going to get too hard, you don't have to worry about that anymore. It's all adjusted for you. Uh, if you worry that the workouts are going to get too easy, you don't have to worry about that. It's going to adjust to you. In fact, just this week, uh, I think adaptive training picked up on the scent that I was maybe sandbagging a bit. I think uh, I'm, I've set my FTP a little bit too low and it was like, Hey, you're getting some serious adaptations, bud <laughs> like, <laughs> all the way through, uh, for the rest of up to until Cape Epic, I had a lot of adaptations that it ended up shifting because of some, some big workouts that I've been doing. So, uh, yeah, it, it always makes sure that you get in the right workout at the right time. So in this case, Tobias, you don't have to worry about the workouts getting too hard or too easy, but that root question of a higher FTP, uh, being correlated with higher weight and vice versa, Chad, uh, what do you think on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a, a valid concern because I think too often we associate a big body w- with high work capability mm-hmm. and that's the case depending on the type of tissue we're talking about. So a higher lean weight is, I think more what you're describing. And that's the basically equates to more muscle mass. That's what's associated with higher FTPs. And, and even within that, a specific lean weight is what we're looking at. So we're not looking for a, a bodybuilder and expecting he or she to, they to crank out 400 watt FTP. We're looking for essentially big legs. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So we're looking for the muscles that drive the pedal stroke. And if you look at examples of that on the world teams, you got Philip Ogana at 82 kilograms, which is 181 pounds. And yeah, in terms of normal human beings, that's that's just not that big. But in terms of cycling, that's very big. Stefan Kung, another guy, he's a big fella. He does not cut a small hole in the wind, but he turns out it turns out a lot of watts, and therefore wins high level time trials, very very key time trials. And then at the high end of the spectrum or the far end of the spectrum is Max Valscheid at 90 kg. That's 198 pounds. That's a big guy. And he hangs in there and he climbs well, reasonably well, based on what you might expect, mm-hmm. but rolls like nobody's business because he's got a lot of watts. He's got a lot of power coming out of very big, strong legs. Like the rest of his body, though, there's not a heck of a lot of mass that isn't working to move that bike forward. So ideally, this is the weight. This lean mass is the weight that won't decrease much or at all as you go through your training. Decreases in fat mass, however, are almost always going to positively affect your watts per kg. The, I mean, losing fat seldom, if ever, is going to take your threshold down along with it. That's just It just doesn't work that way. That's mass that isn't doing anything for you. <clears throat> yes, it's a fuel store, but we've got plenty of that. Regardless of how lean you are, there's plenty on board. So, Tobias, my recommendation for you and anyone in, this, in a similar situation, a lot of us are, 
is to measure your body composition. Don't just look at body weight because body weight is not going to tell you much at all. It's really not. I mean, changes in, in, in water weight alone can, can lead you down daily difficulties or, or just lift you up, even though nothing really changed that nothing meaningful anyway. So in, in doing so, watch your body composition, get one of those Tinnitus scales that we've talked about many times or something similar and do your best to maintain your muscle mass, especially relevant muscle mass. And I say relevant because you have to decide, and this will definitely dovetail into our discussion on cross training, but what's relevant to you? Mm. Pro level cyclists, yep, all they want are the muscles that move the bike. Everyone else, well, we're a little more comprehensive than that. Mm. Additionally, uh, be patient with your rate of fat loss. And, and, and this is a touchy subject because the science is kind of mixed on do I lose it super gradually over time? And that is, gives me a better shot at maintaining that that weight loss or really fat loss, what we're talking about here. Or do I do it rapidly, boost my motivation, and then stay on top of it? And I link to a couple articles that cover both sides of that argument. Mm. And then ideally, we're, we're looking at weight loss. And again, it's really fat loss alongside increasing power outputs. So if you're training through all of this, you should be seeing your numbers go up. I don't care what your weight, your, your watts per kilogram are. We want to see those watts go up, up, up. FTP rises, your three-minute power, your 14-minute, 16-second power. All of these things come up over time, especially those that are relevant to the type of riding you want to do, the type of areas where you want to be strong. <clears throat> and then on the other side of that, when you have loss of weight and it's coupled with loss of sustainable power, and this has to happen on a consistent basis because we all have bad days. We even have bad weeks where you yield those low quality workouts. But if those are becoming part and parcel with your, your, your day in day out, that's a big red flag. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's an indication of a really important imbalance somewhere between your training recovery and nutrition. And those are really the, the three pillars in this instance, either you're training too much relative to your recovery. You're not nourishing enough relative to your training, but something in there is out of whack and it needs to be addressed simply because uh, probably from a health perspective, certainly. And then from a performance perspective, obviously. Yeah. So this brings up something that I, I have a theory, zero science to back this up, but a theory that in with uh, bulking and cutting. So, cause kind of similar along these lines in the sense sure. of like, um, it, you know, for bulking, for the people that don't know, it's usually take in an excess of calories and you do that, uh, habitually coupling it with more training to basically allow yourself to add more lean mass in the bodybuilding world. <clears throat> that's really the goal. So you'll see people go into build phases and cut phases and that cut phase, they'll deprive themselves of calories and they'll, but they'll continue their workload uh, maybe shift a bit of how they do it, but they'll basically deprive themselves of calories. And two things happen. Usually when they bulk, they're like, man, I'm so strong. It's awesome. And then when they're cutting, they're like, oh, I'm so weak. Now let's apply this to cyclists. Cyclists think, okay, I'm, I'm trying to lose a lot of weight. And in most cases that's done. A lot of people are doing that by cutting calories substantially, depriving themselves of calories and their power drops. And the assumption is that, well, since my weight has dropped, my power has dropped and they're just, that they're inseparable. They're tied to each other when really it could just be the lack of nourishment that you're giving your body. You know, when you don't feel your work, you can't do as much. You can't recover as much. You can't do those things that need to happen. Yeah. And then the strongest argument against the too rapid weight loss is that you're going to sacrifice lean tissue along with it. And, yeah. and, and again, I mean, if you, if you're carrying a lot of upper body mass and you don't mind losing some of that, maybe that's not the worst thing, but it's not, uh, it's not necessarily isolated. It's going to come from the, the tissues that you are concerned with. So, and again, I mean, that, that, that's the argument. There is a lot to be said with gaining the motivation of seeing say a five pound drop in that first week, and then maybe t toning it down from there or pursuing that for another couple of weeks and what that does in terms of uh, increasing your motivation across the, the longer span. I mean, really what we're chasing is lifestyle changes. You can't just change your intake, mm -hmm. change your body composition, and then go back to your initial intake and expect everything to just stay where it is. It's going to go back to where you were. And, and with the rebound effect, it's probably going to be worse than it was the, that last time around. So this is <laughs> this is becoming a bigger discussion than I wanted, but but this is lifestyle alteration. You, you you're you're gradually changing things that you can sustain, so that you can yeah. hold the body composition and performance level, uh, hopefully, with, yeah. with you know sustainable changes, stuff that you can live with for the rest of your life. Ivy, you've mentioned that over the past year and even before that, that 
um, you've struggled with, with nourishment balance, right. With nourishing yourself enough. Um, and you know, we always have and flow with that, but when you are nourishing yourself properly, what changes did you notice, whether it was just off the bike or on the bike, both of them? Oh my gosh. Every, <laughs> every facet of my life, like apart from training, like I had more energy, I was able to work better, focus better. Um, and it was so hard to isolate that it was, um, nutrition and like feeding myself because, um, that had all these other trickle down effects. Like I wasn't sleeping as well as I could have. And like my training felt so much more labor intensive than it should have and would have otherwise if I was just eating enough. Um, so it was really hard to pinpoint like what exactly was going on and like getting blood work done and like trying to get more information. Sometimes that can yield results that are also indicative of not nourishing yourself. And so that led to another like rabbit hole of wondering what mm. was going on. So, um, yeah, it's not just about making sure that you're hitting your marks in your workouts. Like it had all these other outstanding effects that enabled me to start hitting my marks in my workouts. Yeah. Uh, there's, and uh, there's so many, and, like you said, all of those things that were kind of acting as layers that you had to work through, all of those things now improve as well once you start nourishing yourself well. It, it's I super guess, tough to yeah. trace it back to the root cause. I mean, you see all these symptomatic manifestations and you you chase each one of those, just like you said, Ivy, and, and it steers you in the wrong direction. I mean, you're, you're addressing an issue, but it's not the underlying issue. Mm -hmm. And the underlying issue is so obvious that I think it's easy to overlook. We're just not getting enough nourishment relative to the amazing amount of work we're asking of our bodies. And there's something to be said when people have to lose, um, if, if it's a, a health concern, um, you know, when we're talking about going from obesity back to a healthy weight that, you know, there, um, it's kind of like what is more unhealthy, you know, and I can, I can, I can sympathize with, with somebody making the decision there to cut back on calories more than somebody else would, because they're trying to get out of that unhealthy space that they're in. Um, so there's no judgment, right? I, I want to make that clear. Like there's no judgment here. Everybody's going to be in a different spot with that. And to achieve health and balance might look very different for somebody compared to another person. But the one thing I think the principle that, that we can agree on is that nourishment is important. It's key. It's crucial to making sure that our bodies are working well on the bike, but also in every other aspect of our life. And in this case, um, Tobias, just bringing back to what Chad was saying, lean mass is the main concern when you're talking about weight being correlated with your ability to put out power. Uh, really, uh, what matters is the lean mass that you have. So make sure you're nourishing amidst this, this transformation that you're undergoing and make sure that you're doing so uh, adequately to drive the training that you're doing. And that's how you'll lose weight and gain power at the same time. So we should link right. Jesse's articles for the trillionth time as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Ivy. Um, okay. Deep dive time, uh, from Andrew. He says, I've been using trainer road for years and just noticed that I completed my 1000th trainer road workout. Way to go, Andrew. So uh, mm -hmm. that's substantial. That's a cool it's a select uh, crew. Yeah. That's a good milestone. He says, I've trained for a variety of cycling events and goals, including cyclocross seasons, gravel races, bike packing, and hill climbs. I appreciate how the product is always improving, and this podcast is an excellent complement to the training platform. Thank <clears> you for that. And thanks to the entire team here at Trainer Road for that, because that's what drives it all and makes it all better. There's so many people behind the scenes at this company that are working all the time that just never get to, you know, they, they aren't on the podcast. Uh, so they don't get to talk to you directly. And, uh, I, I wish they did so they could get, uh, so y'all could express your appreciation for them. But if you want to do that, you can just write in at support at and just let the team know how much you appreciate them. And that would be really cool. Uh, I think that they would appreciate that. So, okay. He says, besides cycling, my other passion is hiking, especially in the winter. I live in upstate New York, and this usually means 15 to 20 mile snowshoe outings with thousands of feet of elevation gain. I must carry substantial gear, usually about 30 pounds. And I found that even when I'm using trainer road most consistently, a hard day of hiking can leave me with a painful case of DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, in my legs. The soreness is most severe in the tops of the quadriceps than the muscles that I use to descend when I'm climbing. And he's talking about climbing on the snowshoes and stuff. 
Uh, sometimes it's so bad that walking downstairs or lowering myself into a chair is agony for a few days after the hike. He my meant hiking to say outing the toilet. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's what he didn't want to say. <laughs> he was keeping it. He was keeping it polite, wasn't he? Yeah, I yeah, took yeah. it there. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, he says my hiking outings are a big commitment, so I can usually only do them once every one or two weeks. It's frustrating to be in such excellent form for cycling and still suffer painful doms after hiking. Insert so many cycling memes about how ridiculously uh, narrow uh, can I guess <laughs> yes, <laughs> how we can just it's, pedal it's a harsh our bicycles. Word, but... <laughs> yeah, we can just pedal our bicycles, but we cannot do anything else. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> I, I sympathize, sympathize with this big time. I know Chad does with backcountry skiing. He and I have talked about this. Like once the season starts, we're like, oh my gosh, like we we're are. We're going to talk about it today. Yeah. 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 And then Ivy, I'm sure with cyclocross too, when I mean, you're doing running and changing that up, that's like a huge wake up call to you uh, and to your body. It's, it's just, it's something we all focus or we all experience here. So Andrew, you're in good company. Um, he says, however, I found that if I introduce a mix of wall sits, lunges and squats into my routine prior to big hiking outings, it makes the doms much less severe. So my question relates mostly to physiology. How can my leg, bu- leg muscles be strong enough to regularly complete challenging threshold workouts on the trainer, yet be so thoroughly thrashed by hiking? Am I using such different muscles for the two activities, or is it that I'm using different fibers within the muscles? Any suggestions about how I can prevent DOMS with minimal effect on my cycling training would also be appreciated. Thanks to the work you all do and thoughtful conversations as well. Chad, I think that we have some great advice for him on this, um, but we also have an opportunity to explain that very thing that he was talking about, where how can I use these muscles to achieve great things when I'm pedaling? And then when I do small things, not pedaling, I am broken. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So uh, first off, let's just, let's just check that box. Let's just talk DOMS briefly because we've talked DOMS more extensively in another podcast, and I'm sure we'll link to that. But really, delayed onset muscle soreness, so muscle soreness after the fact, is, is simply a response to the unfamiliarity of a physical stressor, which sounds sciencey, but it's just anything you're not accustomed to. This is especially true for something that involves eccentric, eccentric contractions. So everything we do on a bike is concentric. So, so when, when the muscle is contracting, it's, it's getting shorter. So it's shortening. We can also contract a muscle when it's getting longer, as, as uh, unlikely as that seems, and that tends to be more destructive. Uh, and, and if you want to dig into the science of that, you can, and I'm sure there are issues to be debated within that. But the fact is, when you do con- eccentric work, you typically are looking at, at a period of DOMS, whether it's familiar or unfamiliar. To an extent, you, you can actually make yourself quite familiar to eccentric contractions, and downhill runners are a perfect example of that. So already you're facing something that's unfamiliar, eccentric contractions. So concentric on the bike. We simply contract the quads and the glutes and then it, turn everything off as best we can. You're also doing it in a, in a weighted manner. I think you said you, you're rucking like 30, 30 pounds, pounds which, which unless you're at 300 pounds, it's going to be more than 10% of your body weight, which is a substantial load. And heavy Top boots of that, and snowshoes. Oh, yeah. Everything else know. is on your body. Yep. And, and snow and just packs miles? into your boot. Yeah. Yeah. Like what? Well, thank you. I can't walk to the next point. Miles. <laughs> exactly. You're doing this for <laughs> hours on end. You take anything and you're doing it for, you know, an hour or two. Uh, some, some level of soreness may accompany that. But when you drag it out three, four, five hours, whatever it may be, considering how long you're hiking, it, muscle soreness is not a surprise at all. And you're doing it with less than optimal consistency. So even in your best case, you're doing <laughs> it weekly. That's a nice way of saying that. <laughs> it's like, it is what yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. do these big hikes every day. And you, I mean, it's tough enough to try to do them every week. But even best case scenario there, you're doing them on a weekly basis, which means you're basically thrashing your body with particular physical insult. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you start to come back. Thursday, you start to feel good again. Friday the detraining has already started. So by the time you hit it with that same shock, even though it's familiar, it's so far removed, the stimulus is not adequate enough to make your body say, I need to fix things. I need to be able to do this better. It needs a more uh, consistent reminder than that. Okay. So with that out of the way, just a a brief overview of DOMS, let's uh, going to get a a little different approach today in that I'm not going to lean super heavy on the science and, and link to a whole bunch of studies, though everything 
is informed largely by experience, but all that experience stems from scientific findings. I mean, these are all things that I understand now because I have the experience and I've linked them to science at some point in time. So it is scientific. It's just not going to beat you over the head with all the research behind it. <coughs> okay. So what we're talking about is the benefits of a variety in your training stimuli. So all the, all the different things you throw at you, how, how much can you vary that and ideally benefit from it in some way? This is more uh, commonly termed cross-training. So before we, before we actually get to the cross-training aspect of it, let's, let's look at what happens to us as cyclists when all we do is ride our bikes. And I can't fault anybody <laughs> for it. I totally get it. A lot of people but, just squirmed, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Understandably. No, this, is, this described yeah. a very a substantial portion of my life, and I know a lot of people can relate to this because they're right in the midst of it. Mm-hmm. So what does only cycling yield? Uh, first off, it affects our bone density. The, just what we described with the, the lack of bone loading, the eccentric contractions, the you know weighting, all the things that you're doing while hiking aren't really taking place on the bike. And because of that bone density, I mean, bone responds to, to the given stressors, right? If you're not loading the bone, why would it fortify itself? It ne- needs something to tell it. I need thicker bones, stronger bones, more dense bones. On top of that, we as endurance athletes, as we've already touched on, it walk this really fine line between adequate nutrition and too much nutrition. We're, try, we're constantly concerned with body composition. We want to be as light as possible, as fast as possible. And because of that, I think most people fall into that rut of, let's call it what it is, malnutrition. It's insufficient nutrition relative to the amount of work we're asking of ourselves. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, what else do we only get from cycling? Uh, in terms of muscularity, legs, period. That's it. You get strong legs. And, and, and yeah, you might get a little bit of strengthening in your low back, maybe a little bit in your shoulders and your forearms, but largely we're talking about <laughs> the legs here. Yeah. And and this, and, and the legs in a particular manner, so this yields muscular imbalances. You know, some muscles are weak, some muscles are tight, and this pulls us out of whack. It's not mm-hmm. favorable. Uh, largely, we see these manifestations in the hips, in the lumbar spine, so your low back, shoulder blades, head and neck, upper cross syndrome. Look it up. I'm not even going to link to it because everybody should know what this is. You need to do your own homework. You need to understand this particular postural distortion because it's super common and it doesn't just affect bike riders. It affects anybody who's in a seated position for most of the day, which describes, well, it describes all three of us right now. And it describes most people who are probably listening to this right now, whether they're on a bike, in a car, seated at a desk. Mm -hmm. Okay. I already mentioned lack of eccentric exposure. We deal in the concentric realm. So we're, we're, shortening our muscles as, as they contract or contracting them as they shorten. And as we improve our movement economy, we get even better at that. We learn to shut off those muscles that would what, what's called reciprocally inhibit them. So, so when your quads fire, your hamstrings need to be turned off. That, that's it. So we're not even countering that quadricep movement with a hamstring movement. We're actually trying to get those muscles to turn off so we can use as min- minimal amount of energy and oxygen, et cetera, during, during each movement. So you, as we get better at what we do, we actually get worse at being cross-trained or being effective doing anything else, really. Yeah, I was just going to say, let's just call it his dad <laughs> at everything else. <laughs> we're really good at making our legs turn circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's about really it. good, exceptionally yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, and then limited movement planes. So again, sagittal plane, period. That's it. That's all we move in. I mean, to some extent, if you're a mountain biker, uh, if you have really poor riding form, you might move in other planes of motion. <laughs> some of those, it, <clears throat> some of those it's favorable, some of them not so much, but I've actually personally termed this movement neglect. I mean, we, 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 we chase one thing at the neglect of all others. In, in this case, movement planes. Mm. And then uh, finally, limited fiber type recruitment. We've talked fiber types quite a lot, the continuum from slow all the way up to fast. And this is a slow twitch game. So if you look at that continuum, not only are we super narrow, I mean, we're, we're way down at the slow end, the slow twitch end of things. We rarely touch the high end of things. And even when we think we do, like during a sprint or during a surge up a hill, you're still not, not getting up there, not, not to where strength training, for instance, would touch. The closest thing cyclists come to it is a track stand, is a start from a track stand. So if you're not a track sprinter, and even those guys hit the weights super hard. So it's, it's hard. I can't attribute their musculature or their, their muscularness, muscle, no, whatever, muscularity, <laughs> that's the word I was looking for, <laughs> to, to those standing starts. Yeah. Rather, they get it in the gym. So what I'm saying here is that this is a metabolic sport. We don't tax the neuromuscular system uh, in, uh, equally. We simply don't. So the, 
the the link between the brain and the muscles is simply to our slow twitch tissues uh, and or muscle t- muscle fibers, and and we're we're metabolic. We need to learn how to break down and remanufacture energy. That's our game. We need to do that as efficiently as possible for as long as necessary, depending on the type of event we do. But in terms of neuromuscular stimulation, it's pretty limited. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Which brings us to cross training. So. With respect to this topic, I see it coming down to two questions. First off, what typically limits our performance? You know, performance limiters. We've talked about these a number of times. We're going to look at it in a more general sense. So not just specific to cycling, although there will be plenty of overlap. But in general, what limits our athletic performance or even day-to-day performance? Question two, how can each of these benefit from cross-training? So I'm going to get – pretty broad with this, but I will try to tie it back into cycling whenever possible. And I, I want to give a takeaway with each of these, uh, each of these uh, limitations that I'm just about to discuss. Mm-hmm. So first off, and I've already touched on this, is the unfamiliarity with a challenge. And there are so many examples of this. I mean, you can, you can be in a similar mode of exercise. So you could be like a, a 300 kg bench presser, <clears throat> someone who can put up 660 pounds on the bench press. This is a real thing. <laughs> it blows it's my insane. mind. It's <laughs> insane. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and these, are, these are strong, strong people. They wander into their you know, local gym because I don't imagine they spend much time in a, 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 the type of facilities I'm looking at. And they get on the fly <laughs> machine and they, they draw their arms out away from the body and bring them together in front of their body. They do a pec fly, right? A pectoral fly. And they're dreadfully sore for the next day, way worse the second day, because this is an unfamiliar action. No matter how strong their chest muscles already are, this is a new way of utilizing those muscles, and they get sore from it. Mm-hmm. Similar mode of training, or, or uh, in this case, bike riding, crit racing versus cross-country mountain bike racing. On paper, they look so similar that you think if you're good at one, you're going to be good at the other. And that is not necessarily the case. The demands are different. Crit racing stays at a high stable speed and then accelerates from that. Mountain bike racing, you can go from complete stop almost to an all-out effort and everywhere in between. Mm -hmm. So being good at one, and I can speak from experience, does not automatically make you good (laughs) at being another. At the height of my crit racing prowess, I would get spanked in cross-country races. It just was what it was until, well, I focused on cross-country racing, then I improved. They take non-similar modes of activity. So look at Grand Fondo riding versus what Jonathan and I just hinted at, ski touring. On paper, again, super similar. You're doing pretty low-intensity exercise for long hours, you know, just trudging up. I mean, we all know what a Grand Fondo is, century, whatever. Ski touring, you're trudging up a mountain at a a slow pace, carrying a bunch of gear, transitioning and skiing down. But but Mm -hmm. 90% of your day is spent hiking. Again, similar looking, but be, get really good at Grand Fondos and then go do a bike or a, a touring <laughs> trip in uh, BC and see what your muscles tell you. you you'll learn <laughs> what hip flexor, hip flexor pain is like. Forearms, I, it was a crazy surprise. My traps from just lifting the pole. I mean, all these things like, yeah. oh yeah, those muscles are there too. <laughs> yeah. And let's take it to the elite level. Let's look at elite level riders and even include Olympic level athletes and pit them against... Yard work. And, and I bring this up specifically because Jonathan mentioned it. He's a high-level mountain biker, yet he had to do some work in his yard. <laughs> oh, and yeah. you tell us, Jonathan, what happened. Oh, oh, destroyed. Destroyed. Absolutely. Like, And then you get on the bike and your ability to train is compromised just because you decided to bend over for like four hours. Maybe not even that. Give yourself 40 minutes, bend over for 40 minutes and pull weeds and then you're done. You know, I think a lot of us, this is probably sympathize or a lot of us can sympathize with this. We have these routines that we're used to and we think we pride ourselves on, on what we can accomplish in that realm and rightfully so. But then as soon as we step even remotely close to going outside of that, if we haven't experienced that or we aren't trying to cover our bases, then boy, it really throws us for a loop. You know, yep. and that, that yep. was absolutely me a year, you know, a couple of years ago and be, and behind that. And when I was having knee issues and everything else, I wasn't doing cross training. I wasn't doing strength training. I wasn't doing anything like that. I was trying to minimize any activity that was not pedaling my bicycle. And as a result, anytime life gave me any one of the variables that it always gives me, I would be compromised. I wouldn't be able to train, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yep. And that, that shines a very bright light on what we're talking about here is that anytime we challenge the muscles in a novel way, something new to us, to, to which we're unaccustomed, you get unpredictable and often very sobering results. It's, it's kind of a bummer, 
to, to see what your current limitations are. Uh, and this, yet another personal term, I refer to these as unsuccessful encounters <laughs> in that they beat you. They may not beat you completely, but they definitely beat you down. So in, in the moment you have failed, you have failed <laughs> at whatever this is. You failed in a general sense at life and you got to bring yourself back from it. Yeah. I do, however, want to point out that I recognize you can't be good at everything. I get that. I'm not saying we all have to be expert generalists. That's this term that just fascinates me. It makes no sense to me at all. But we, we cannot be good at all things, okay? Yeah. But we can address this, and quite simply, how do we address it? Do other stuff. Just, just do other things. And I'm going to elaborate more on that as we move through this. Okay, now another limitation are energy systems. And I'm going to use runners as an example. You, you compare a 400-meter runner to a marathoner. I mean, the things that Usain Bolt is good at, the things that Elliot Kipchoge are good at, is good at, those two things can't be compared. Those two guys are going to make each other look idiotic in, in their own realms, right? <laughs> that, that's yeah. just how it goes. But, and I, and I link to this paper, the comparison between how you train an 800-meter runner versus a 1,500-meter runner, something that sh- should be almost identical, right, can be drastically different. Mm. The, the point being that even in a tight middle distance range, there can be dramatic differences in the training that's necessary to make these runners the best at their particular distance. Mm-hmm. So how do you address that? Basically what we do every day on, on, on a trainer or a plan is train other energy systems. And, and if you're not on a plan, you're just riding your bike, don't do the same thing all the time. If you're happy just kind of noodling up pretty much everything and, and coasting on downhills and do different things, do, do little sprints at the start of the hill, go on a long grind, push, push too big a gear up a hill, but go up a hill that's just long, even though you're not geared for it and you have to muscle it out. Face a long day every now and again. If your long day is an hour and a half, do a three-hour day. Do a two-hour two day. Just do something that's outside of what you're used to. Go do a cyclocross race, you know, something yeah, different. Totally. <laughs> yeah. 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 Be, be, be prepared to look like an idiot and be okay with it. <laughs> it yeah. It's going to happen, and it's, Nobody it's humbling, is, yeah. but it's enlightening. Nobody's immune from this. All cyclists, whatever, all the other people that are riding bikes, they all face the same thing that you'd face. So no matter how confident you are in one realm, you're going to come up against something that's going to make you feel more (laughs) than a bit foolish. Yeah. yeah, Okay. So somatotype, which is just a fancy term for body type. And and I want to approach this from two angles. First, there's the mental side of things. And this is where our physique steers us. And and it can be favorable, but often not as much. So the comments or the self-talk, I'm too big to run. I'm too small to lift weights. These are all things that because our body is a particular way, we just assume we, we let fate steer us as it were. Mm. The other side of that is that is the physical side. And yes, body types are pretty much unchangeable. If you're an ectomorph, you're going to be an ectomorph. That's, that's just how it is. But body composition is highly plastic. That's something we can affect quite easily. And, and, and the most accessible get in terms of altering your body composition is cross training, especially, and this will be a recurring theme and it is a recurring theme across every podcast we've ever done is that strength training is, is exceptional for fat loss. It's exceptional for muscle gain. It is, in my opinion, inarguably unrivaled when it comes to durability, which is the topic we're going to touch on in a bit. Mm. I challenge any listener to name one athlete who hasn't benefited from the integra- integration of strength training into their training routine. No one goes backwards. No one adds strength training and suddenly becomes a lesser athlete as a result of it. Yeah, you may be sore the first day you take it up, right? That, that, because it's a novel stimulus. Just like anything. Yeah. Yep. But then if that's something that you include, uh, in, in, with any sort of regularity, you'll see improvements. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So how, how do we address the, the body type limitation? First off, on the mental side, don't accept your fate. You can do anything. I, seriously, just just do it. Make yourself do it. Mm-hmm. And on the physical side of things, hit the gym. Move some damn weights. Just, just try it. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now another limitation is rate of recovery, um, a term that – a cute little term I've used from time to time is recoverability. And from the, from the training perspective, as, as we become more varied in the things we do, the, the more widely benefited as a result. So it, everything we do just kind of layers on top of the other thing we already knew how to do. Mm-hmm. Our physical capabilities grow and our body becomes more adapted to work in a general sense. And then we get to decide what kind of work and we get to do it without a fear of consequences if we're, you know, not, not constantly – facing those little minor failures <laughs> yeah. because our body just isn't adapted to doing anything but riding a bike. Yeah. Then from the recovery perspective, 
fewer derailments due to these un, un, unsuccessful encounters that are referred to. You just, you get to stay on track. Anytime we do something, for instance, these hikes, if he's so sore that his next Tuesday workout, which was supposed to be, you know, a high quality VO2 max workout can't be done, you know, bails out early or just can't hit the numbers, whatever. Well, that's, that's a training derailment. So again, that, that's really a matter of priorities, but in any case, because your body wasn't adapted to all the different things that it can do, you're paying, your, your cycling training is paying a price. Mm -hmm. So how do we address this? First off, you have to recognize those long recovery courses. So, so anything you do, you have to say, I know from past experience, this takes me a long time to come back from this sort of thing. And this is, it's kind of a a situation where you have to decide, do I omit that? Do I modify it? You know, correct it. And, And a good example would be strength training on a race week. There's, there's very little to be gained by running yourself down in the gym when you have an important event on Saturday, right? Mm-hmm. And this is just a cost benefits analysis based on priorities. This is why we classify races into A, B, and C events. So C event, maybe you strength train because your strength training is on track and you want to keep it so. But if it's an A event, again, there's, there's little, if anything, to be gained by burying yourself yeah. under the squat rack coming into nationals. Kate Courtney is probably, uh, this week as of recording this, she's traveling to snowshoe for a world cup. And I bet that this week she wasn't going for any sort of PRs, right. With her squat or her deadlift, uh, <laughs> sure, you know, certainly not while she was probably touching up on strength training as she typically seems to, I doubt that she was prioritizing it over her racing. Mm-hmm. So yep. it's good to keep Kate's, it in perspective. <clears throat> Kate's one of my upcoming examples. She's actually a, a, a mm-hmm. shining example of, of points I'm trying to make here. Um, okay. So another limitation is injury. And this is perhaps the best case for cross training, uh, from, from two perspectives. First from that of prevention, <clears throat> because <clears throat> excuse me, when it, when it comes to overuse injuries, they're pretty predictable that we're not surprised by them. And, and usually they're slow onset. So you get a little bit of a niggle and it's like, mm, that could be something I'm going to keep training anyway. Well, you, you're making your bed. So just go ahead and lie in it and don't complain when that injury <laughs> turns into something that is more substantial. Sure. And even, even before that niggle arises, knowing that, for instance, I'm a runner and I know that runners typically have knees that fall inward and, and, and certain low body distortions because we have, or they have weak external rotators. So I'm going to do some banded sidewalking that hits my glute medius minimus because I want to prevent this. I don't ever want to have that injury in the first place. But when you do have that injury, now you're addressing it or you're approaching it from the rehabilitation perspective, which is basically forced exploration into these alternate exercise modes. And you can get pretty creative when you're trying to maintain your VO2 max or uh, lately I've been dealing with a lumbopelvic hip issue, been in the pool. I have a pool now, which is pretty awesome, more than I ever would have anticipated considering how chilly it's getting. <laughs> so <clears throat> how, how do we address this? Always be learning. And, and that applies to just about every everything in life in general. But in this case, before, during, and after injury, learn as much as you can to prevent the injury, learn as much as you can about the injury if you're in the throes of it, and learn as much as you can afterward in in order to prevent it from happening again. Hmm. Which brings us to durability. And this is absolutely essential to endurance athletes to the point where I say, if you lack it, you either fix it or you choose another sport. Yeah. I, I, go throw darts, go bowl. Uh, lately, <laughs> I've started. I've started shooting guns, which you know, I live yeah. in Washington now. I'm so close to Idaho. I, guns are a part of life up here. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 not a an, a an endeavor that requires a heck of a lot of durability. Um, but what's important is to notice that performance improvement comes in a number of ways. We know this. Some of them are measurable. Some of them not so much. And durability is one of those things that can't be measured, but that doesn't mean it can't be improved. It absolutely can't. So how do we address this? First, you have to recognize it and then you can address it. And, and we're, we're offered opportunities all the time to see examples of where our durability limits may lie. For instance, if you do a four hour ride, I'm sorry, a five hour event and you're four hours into it and the wheels start to come off the wagon. Well, you know, my durability may be about four hours Mm -hmm. with the caveat that is circumstances dependent. And that brings me to environmental factors. And yes, these two are a case for cross training because familiarization with, with the elements can and do impact performance. Anytime you come up against these adverse or challenging or unfamiliar conditions, Think about when you <clears throat> toe in the line, 
you're towing the line on a rainy day, or it's way colder than you thought and you're not dressed for it, or it's a muddy course. You know, you line up uh, at, at the cross race and you've never really done a muddy off camber stretch and you're already <laughs> in your head. All of this is flashing before Ivy's eyes <laughs> as cyclocross for all of our ears. <laughs> <laughs> Cold, rain, mud, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. But but what happens in this case is the race is basically over before it begins. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you're going to totally fail, but you've already accepted that I am not – this is not my forte. I'm not good at this. I don't even know how to respond <laughs> to this. And as a result, I, I don't expect much of myself this day. Mm-hmm. Those, those just aren't the days where you excel. You, you can't do it with that mental mindset, that mm-hmm. mindset. Mm-hmm. So how do we address this? And this is kind of a fun one. You, you, well, fun to talk about, maybe not fun to experience, <laughs> Type but two. you have to expose yourself <laughs> to the elements, especially if they're likely. If you're a cross racer and you haven't ridden in mud, that's on you. If, if you live in the Pacific Northwest and you don't know how to corner in rain, that's on you. Those days where it's raining and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to ride the trainer today, uh-uh. Load that outside ride, get outside, and learn how to corner in the rain. You don't have to get extreme with it, but you do have to expose yourself with it mm-hmm. or to it. Um, so so you can create your, your hard days too. If, if there are circumstances that are likely, you know, I'm probably going to have to race in rain versus circumstances that are unlikely. I'm going to be caught in a blizzard. Mm. But you can make yourself go out and do those things. The, the benefits are tremendous in that you become mentally prepared for anything. And I mean anything, things that you couldn't even imagine when you're beset with them, you think, I've done this, 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 and this. And while this is completely outside of that, I feel like I can probably handle anything based on what I've done in the past. Mm-hmm. So for, for instance, the other day, we're socked in in smoke here, and that was probably a bad day to ride, but the heat was 104, and I wanted to... I wanted to see what it's like to ride in 104 degrees. And I know Alex was talking about this as, as well. He did repeats in 100 degrees sort of thing. Yeah. It, 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 even if the, the training is minimized, maybe it's not your best day. Maybe you don't eke everything out of that workout that you had anticipated or were supposed to, but you went out there and you experimented a, a bit just to acquaint yourself with what it's like to be in these extreme uh, environmental circumstances. Then should that happen or anything, even you know a, a pale version of it happen during a race – you're already that much ahead of everyone else, at least on the mental side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which brings us to the last point, which is mental boundaries. And again, cross training does apply here because anything that expands your familiarity with new challenges is a win. So Mm -hmm. in that vein, don't underestimate the value of confidence because just the belief, just like I said, just the belief that you can handle something, it can be half the battle. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think there's a Lance Armstrong quote about this. I think some race that was extremely cold and rainy. And I remember him like uh, saying that like, you know, somebody was basically like, oh, this is miserable. It was one of his teammates was saying like, oh, this is miserable, right? Like, can't you believe how cold and rainy it is? And he was like, he's like, yeah, 90% of the field already gave up. This is awesome. You know, yeah, like, I do uh, remember that, yes. yeah, I, I can't remember the context of that, but, and, and Lance is polarizing as a character as he tends to be, or as he is. He also uh, definitely was was uh, a mentally hard person in this regard. Yeah, and I think had his that, mental game figured out. Yeah, and I think that there's a whole lot to be said for that, for being able to rise above things genuinely when they show up. I mean, Ivy, you've raced in pro pelotons in, down in Australia and all around the world and you've had these different varying circumstances. And those, when something comes up, it's kind of like wildfire, right? Like in a race, like if something like if, whether it's a tricky course, that's technical, whether it's weather, whether it's anything like that, it has a collective effect on everybody, but Mm -hmm. you can rise above it. And there's a lot of power to that. You know, uh, you're not the only one experiencing like Mm. bad road conditions, you know, like everyone is riding in the same conditions and the mental part of it is is maybe more important than like the physical capability of being able to handle it. I wonder how much of this is so cyclocross breeds that right in the sense that you're almost always racing in less than ideal conditions because 
I mean, just to even start with your bike is less than ideal for whatever you're riding it on. Right. It's a road bike. Yeah. That's like the nature. That's like the spirit <laughs> yeah. of cycle cross is to be <laughs> totally. like, n- under biked at all times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you look at riders like Matthew Vanderpool, Wout Van Aert, uh, Mariana Voss, all these incredible athletes that have had huge success across their different realms. And I wonder with those three examples individually, how much of their success comes down to their ability to be able to just deal with things that others are paralyzed by, you know? Um, and, and not only mentally, but also physically as well, because that sport of cyclocross forces you to be more well-rounded than, you know, just uh, take like a pure time trialist or something. It's, it's very different. Um, requires you to be a different person across the board. So yeah, yeah. great points, Chad. Um, completely. Let me, let me wrap up the, the mental boundary, uh, just a couple of things I want to touch on in terms of that mm. particular type of limitation is that the, fr- from the perspective of prevention of mental stagnation and a decrease in motivation, change things up if for no other reason than to keep it interesting. I don't, I don't know if people generally do this, but I've tried to do the same workout five days in a row and carry that for multiple weeks. You notice the workout's cool. productive. You want to you want to chase a particular adaptation, pursue a particular energy system. So you find this workout, and, and Nate had this very plan. He called it something that that I won't repeat, but it, it was a <laughs> the idea being you do this workout and you do it day in day out. And the next week you up your threshold a little bit. You repeat that workout day in day out. And that's it's how good a fun and fun. experiment <laughs> in paper on paper. Yeah. But you try to do that and man, the motivation necessary to get on the bike during that second week, it's, it's, it's just not there. So, so again, a bit of variety goes a long ways into maintaining training motivation and, and therefore momentum. Um, so, so how do we address the mental boundaries limitation? Do something hard every day. And, and I don't mean just phys- physically, also mentally, emotionally, intellectually. Just something outside of your comfort zone qualifies. But every day, challenge yourself in just a small way. Okay, so now, closing thoughts. I'm going to wrap this up with uh, what I'm terming real talk. <laughs> oh, boy. Like that's a thing. <laughs> Buckle up. I should say. If, if it wasn't real before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so my advice to you is you pick. Do you want to be capable in numerous sport and lifestyle realms, or do you want to be a true specialist? You have to decide where are your priorities. And if you haven't had that come to Jesus moment, you need to have it. And then you can ask, you can answer, would varying my training hurt or help those goals and move forward accordingly. But for some reason, I think there's a belief and maybe it's a reality that being a great cyclist means you have to be a limited athlete. And, And maybe that's true, but the reality for most of us is that we just want to be good cyclists. And that leaves a lot of room for us to be good at a whole number of things. So mm-hmm. the, the point is, is that degree, two degrees, you can have it all. And even the specialist can. I mean, just a bit of core strength training goes a long ways. And good examples of that, and I, I'd be willing to bet they do more than core training, Matthew Vanderpool, Wout Van Aert, Nino Schurter. I have evidence of all these fellas doing core training and strength training. Video of it, seen it happen. Mariana Voss, Yolanda Neff, uh, Pauline ferran Prevost, Kate Courtney, as we just mentioned. All of these riders, again, video footage of them doing core training and or strength training. And five of those riders that I just mentioned are cyclocross riders. So you know they at least vary their training in as much as they do some running. Mm-hmm. And, then, and this just kind of shines a light on you. Look at those athletes, and even within one sport, they have varied capabilities, and look how much they excel. And I promise you it's not because they just grab a different bike on different days. They're, they're doing other things. So at the world level, this is, this is tremendously specific, but for most of us, which leads me to the way I'm going to close this out, which is a little nod to the fellows over at Stronger by Science, is my hot take. First, be a capable human, and then you layer specific aptitudes on top of that. Don't be a cyclist who cross trains. Be an athlete who focuses on cycling. Hmm. I like that perspective. And it's funny because that highlights the... <clears throat> It's a cool thing about our sport, but it's also, it can push us into kind of bad areas. So when we see Pauline Ferran Prevost racing, it's her, her kit and her bike. And I can go buy that very bike and I can go and do a race and I can do what they're doing. Whereas, I don't know, if I like NASCAR or something, I can't go out and buy Jimmy Johnson's car and and go race around Talladega. Like that doesn't, I can't do that, right? Um, if it's, I can't go be Valentino Rossi on, you know, Monza or something like that. It doesn't work. <clears throat> so in our sport, we have this ability to, to, and I'm saying this in air quotes, do exactly what the pros do. 
so we we look at everything they do and and then we think okay I must do that in order to to be this athlete. So when we see Chris Froome not touching a single bit of luggage and instead he has like his entourage and his family like loaded like you know pack mules carrying all the luggage through the airport we think well I should not even carry a backpack. <laughs> you know like like we take it to this extreme <clears throat> and we don't need to because there's so much other low hanging fruit and there's life to be healthy for that all of us experience. We don't have the luxury of distilling our life and focusing our life to that degree that, it, that a professional athlete does. But even then I would argue that the most successful athletes that we're seeing these days are athletes that are not <clears throat> so narrow focused. Um, they're athletes that do a whole lot more. I know Julian Alaphilippe, I've seen videos of him doing strength training. Um, uh, one of the best cyclists that we have uh, in the world, right? Um, one of the best climbers that we have even in the world. It's amazing. And he isn't an, he isn't like averse to actually touching a weight. So uh, I, I agree, Chad. And, and this is a, your, your hot takedown there makes me feel like I'm in crosshairs in a good way. And the fact that I view myself as a cyclist who cross trains, but maybe I should switch that around, especially because I'm happy a, to work. I have. Call anybody your yard work. Yard work athlete that focuses on cycling. <laughs> You're a specific type of do athlete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yard work and mountain biking. I've got to dive. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ivy, you face this. Uh, how much cross-country skiing do you do? Uh, because you live up in Montana, so you kind of have that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, starting this winter, mostly, um, quite a bit. Um, mm. it's, a, it's a big part of my winter here. Yeah, that, I mean, what a wonderful activity that does. And just in terms of like the wrapping it back up to the beginning of what you were talking about here, Chad, but that sagittal plane that we work in the just unilateral motion, we're just working in one specific way on the bike and with cross country skiing, you're pressing out laterally and you have, you're bringing your legs back in. You're doing something well, totally different. It's why I chose skate skiing specifically Skating, versus yeah. just classic, because when I would just classic ski, um, it just Same felt emotions. too much. It felt too much like riding a bike. Um, and, uh, I didn't feel like it was doing a lot for me, even like aerobically. Like I couldn't go like fast enough <laughs> to yeah. like make it worthwhile. Um, it was, it was weird. Yeah, it was weird. Um, so yeah, skate skiing is, is what I use and being able to use more of my body completely and have that lateral motion has helped tremendously. Yeah. It makes life a whole lot more enjoyable too, because there are things that you just don't pass up then. And they're cool experiences. Like, I don't know, your friend has a soccer or softball team, like an adult rec league thing. And they're like, Hey, we need a sub. And you're like, I'm sorry, I can only move in the sagittal plane. Um, but instead like, <laughs> <laughs> you can say, yeah, let's go do that. <laughs> you know, um, helping your friend load a U-Haul. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Activities. Um, Fun. Yeah. You, you have a, a sprinkler break or something in the yard. It, you look at that and instead of seeing like a 32 watt drop in your FTP, you see it as, Hey, like, let's do it. Um, you know, I can fix this problem. So I, 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 there's, there's a lot of richness in life that, that can be missed when we get too focused and boy, all of us amateur cyclists are definitely at times guilty of getting way too serious for, and, and we lose perspective and cross training is just a great way for us to, to get immune from that and to have a more rich life experience, I think. So hot takes, but good takes, Chad. I, I dig it. Um, rapid fire. Let's get into it. Okay. From Kieran says, what is your favorite format of racing to watch? And is that different from your favorite format to participate in? Ivy, you, you start us off. Uh, yeah, I feel like I don't actually watch a ton of bike racing these days. I uh, just try to, just trying to keep it together, you know? Like, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think that I like to watch like the last 10 or 20 K of spring classics only because, um, I have like a, a group of friends that we like watch it together and like <laughs> talk crap. And yeah, so it, I like to, I like to do that because it's like a, it's like a camaraderie thing to do with my buddies. And I definitely don't like to race road spring classics anymore. So yeah, <laughs> they're different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chad, how about you? I'd be a toss up between cyclocross and spring classics. And I watch spring classics from start to finish. Um, in, <clears throat> in terms of participation, uh, man, anymore. I, I don't even know. I, 
I, I, I don't do anything anymore. I, I'm keen on gravel racing these days. <laughs> I don't How's do that? anything anymore. <laughs> we need drops. That needs to be a drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think for me, my favorite form of racing to watch is the same thing that I like to do the most. I know that I'm just very normal and not exciting, but it's cross country racing. It's my favorite, uh, favorite one to watch and to do. So I do like watching downhill and on the roadside, uh, it's tough for me to watch grand tours. The Vuelta is, is an exception. I'm, I'm happy to watch that, but boy, spring classics. Yeah. Twist my arm. Love that stuff. So, okay. Deej says you can either fuel your ride exclusively with flaming hot Cheetos, or you cannot fuel at all. Which do you choose? <laughs> I'll take this. That's a perfect opportunity to eat Cheetos. I'll, I'll do it. Just this once. Yeah. I see no problem. What's oh, the I problem? could not. There's no way I could feel with flaming hot Cheetos. I would be, it, it burn while I eat them and either burn while I get rid of them through ever, which method that happens, but I promise you it will be prompt and not when I, the ride is over. So no way I would feel with flaming hot Cheetos, but I have a soft gut. So, <clears throat> okay. Mark's just trying to attack me with all these rapid fire questions and get inside my head. And he does. So I'm going to read these and then you guys let me know if they concern you or not with just a yes or no. Okay. So he says, if you use a friend's shock pump, are you worried that the manufacturer tolerance tolerance may be more than 0.5 PSI and therefore different than your pump? Are you concerned about these things? Oh, great. Okay, good. I'm not alone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, This is, this keeps me up at night. Can you tolerate if the writing (laughs) on your stem cap is not perfectly straight? For sure. The writing. Oh, can I tolerate it? No. Oh yeah. 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 I don't care about that. Yeah. That's fine. Oh, I can't tolerate it. If it's crooked, I, I will stop and loosen a bolt, do whatever I no. need to do to realign When that. Stephen Lewis built my first mountain bike f- for us at Trainer Road, the first thing I noticed was that the stem cap, stem cap was perfect and the little washers underneath with the little Rock Shocks logos were all perfectly lined up. And it just made everything in like 10 watts, right? <laughs> it was like, you got right there. No, I just, yeah. I just trusted that the rest of the bike is going to be that tightly put together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I cannot handle that. Yeah. Do all of your pedals have the exact same resistance setting? hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. hundred percent. Good. Okay. I'm feeling way less. I'm feeling way less weird now. This is great. Uh, This is healthy for me. Are you comfortable wondering if when you remove the pump from your tire, if the amount of air that comes out with that sound was the same as the last time, or did you lose more air? (laughs) Yes. Yeah. 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 Shameful. Yes. This This is what digital gauge is for. Yeah. This is what, yeah. But even the digital gauge, when you pop it off, you get a little I was like, yeah, yes. that's what true. was that? Point one, point five. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. And then that's why you run these wireless sensors, uh, the, the whatever the cork tire whiz or something on your bikes. Yeah, Which are fantastic. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Tons of money, but hey, uh, do you tighten your shoes the same number of clicks every time? I don't do this. I, I can't do. count my boa clicks. Same number, both shoes. Oh, I'm tick, 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 tick. <laughs> <laughs> I, know I just know the sound. <laughs> I mean, I like rip off my shoes like an animal though. So like who knows how many clicks it takes, to, like, you know, your starting point, your bait, you need to recalibrate your shoes is what you're saying yeah. that they're not, yeah. Yeah, they're not left at the same spot. Yeah. yeah. Um, ever enter a downhill and question if your through axles are tight? No, absolutely not. Because I am a nerd that always makes sure that everything is tight before I ride. Yeah. Same. I've, no way. I've run loose through axles and loose quick releases and learned. Oh, I- just, just the contemplation of what could have happened shook me. So, oh yeah, I check them. Yeah, uh, will you admit that? Oh, wh- sorry. One quick note on through axles. The most horrific story I've ever been told, I think, about bikes was last a couple weeks ago when I was in Park City with Keegan. He was telling me about when he was a kid. He looked down and noticed that his through axle wasn't tight, so he reached down while he was riding to go smack that through axle back in, and his arm went into his spokes and it threw him over the bars, and somehow his arm wasn't chopped off. At least he got the whole arm fitted in fingers. <laughs> right? Horrific. Mm. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, this is when he was a kid. He's he's fine. He hasn't done this <laughs> since. Um uh next one. He says, Will you admit that you measure the knobs on your tires for wear rather than just eyeballing it like the rest of us? <laughs> I don't do that actually. Yeah. I actually get excited when the knobs wear down on my mountain bike tires because I'm like, that's way faster than when it was brand new. So, <laughs> and I, yeah. So, like Leadville, I'm planning on saving. If I do Leadville again, uh, I'm planning on saving some worn out tires to run during that race. Then I can have some like extra fast tires. So, less knob, more fast. Um, okay. When was the last time you rode without a head unit just by fuel? All the time. I mean, not, not like 
all the time, every time. So like, <laughs> probably, yeah. probably like once a week, I do it twice, maybe. Yeah, you've had you've you're you have a good balance of that, Ivy. Mm-hmm. Chad, I'm not sure if I ever have. I mean, there's always a head unit. I mean, I look at it every time. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I kind of leave it be, but it's always on there. Uh, I usually do recovery rides with my watch. Um, instead, my my I have a forerunner Garmin forerunner. That doesn't count. That's just a head mm-hmm. unit that's on your wrist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I don't look at it. You know, I I ride and I I know what one sixty five or two hundred or whatever the wattage needs to be, and then I'll check it once and I'll be like, yep, okay, lock into that, and then I just stay there and that feeling. Yeah. I don't know. It's as close as I get. Sorry, that's not very adventurous. <laughs> very liberating. To, yeah, it is. To, on your endurance stays, just you know, like. When, when yeah. I retire from trainer road, I do plan to build bikes without power meters and without head units. I'm, I'm get not back kidding. to the core of, 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 of your experience of why you ride bikes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I dig it, Chad. Proud yeah. You've you. earned that. Okay. Ian, did any of the hosts ever wear underwear under their cycling shorts at one time? Be honest. <laughs> yeah, for no. sure. Definitely. Uh, no. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's because I played I, I, volleyball first and like we wear, you wear underwear on your, your spandex under your uniform. And so when I switched to bike shorts, I was like, these are the same. They're the same shorts. Why would it be so different? One has a pad. That's fair. You wear underwear. We don't wear underwear. Like, yeah. <laughs> I learned, gross people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I not to do that really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so no, I, I, I never did. I sure I made a whole lot of other ridiculous mistakes, but that one I did not. Um, Ryan, it seems like there aren't many new innovations with road bikes right now. If you had to pick one and money was no object, what would you get? You're saying we can invent an innovation or, um, no, I think he's just saying that like, uh, bikes aren't that interesting right now in his opinion. So, uh, which one would you get? I want a dropper on road bikes. That's what you want. Yeah. A bike that has a road or a dropper. That's the innovation you want. What bike would you get though? Chad, if money was no object, I don't have one. Money kind of is no object. I mean, when it comes to bikes, that's the one thing I totally splurge on. So <laughs> that's where Chad yeah. doesn't draw lines. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't have any road bikes I lust after, honestly. Like none. Road bikes just don't I don't know. I I think I would like a uh Squid makes a steel track bike now, like a like a it's called the Taekwondo. It's like a I, I think it'd be really fun to do one of those for like really long winter base mile rides and just like paint it up all pretty. That's, that's on my list. I like that. Yeah. yeah. I have none road bikes. Don't do it for me. It's like, a, I don't know. Like <laughs> I'm sure somebody in the world is like really excited about getting a different type of shovel, but to me it's just a utility. And that's kind of how I feel with road bikes too. They're just a utility. I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, somebody says, Jonathan, what made you pick the Epic? I'm going to buy an XC race bike soon. I'm wondering what stood out to you about the bike rather than other bikes. Thanks. Uh, go to my Instagram and you can see a video where I discuss that very thing. Um, I, I covered the whole thing. Follow us all on Instagram and trainer road. You'll get fantastic, uh, training tips and even a meme every once in a while from trainer road. Fantastic memes. Okay. Will says crit racing Our crit season is nearing in Australia. What are your go-to moves? Dive inside or swoop the outside? There's a few of these, but let's cover this one first. Inside. You, if, inside guy? Gutter. Ooh, inside gutter. Ivy, That's, how about you? Uh, is there room inside? Is there a gap? <laughs> Hold on. We're assuming there is. Gap? You're overthinking this. <laughs> <laughs> if you can pick, uh, and if there is room for either, where would you? Where do you prefer to be? Inside? Inside. <sighs> inside. Hmm. I, I prefer guess. outside. Yeah, I prefer outside. I like to be able to, to carry that momentum and, and surprise. I've always preferred that, though. I've always preferred the wide line. So, okay. Uh, attack early or save it? Save it. I'm the two laps, one laps to go guy. Yeah. It's my, it's my, it's my tactic. Brain says save it, but my Used experience. Yeah, my experience says I attack too early. So, yeah, I guess I'm attack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, chase moves or risk missing the break? I typically wait. Mm-hmm. You, you'll risk it. You'll let a group mm-hmm. go up the road and you're, you, yeah, you trust. It's, it's almost always covered. And, and then when the gap grows large enough, that's when you know, <clears throat> either jump across now or I'm racing for fourth. Uh, probably risk it. Yeah. I've once again, heart says something 
and mine says other. So my, I, I know that I have a bad track record of chasing. So I should Covering probably everything. just say chase. There are too many, con- there are too <laughs> cover, many cover, like, cover. qualifying conditions for these questions. It's like, yeah, I'm destroyed right now. <laughs> I don't like it way too hard. <laughs> yeah. attack, attack, attack with one lap to go or sprint. Sprint. I made that clear. Chat. Although in my older yeah. days when I had the power to make a two laps to go, one laps to go move stick, but now I kind of hover and try to find the right wheel and pray. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ivy sprint sprint for sure. Yeah. You're a sprinter. Yeah. I I'd, I'd say I'm a one to go a uh, sprint with 200 meters or 500 or 50 meters to go not 500 <laughs> sprint with 250 <laughs> meters to go. I'm better I'm at 50. the shorter stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm 50. Yeah, 200. All of us. Favorite type of si- si- uh, sunglass lenses for mountain biking in the woods? Ooh. The Oakley prisms. Yeah, the yeah. trail torch. They make a prism trail lens. Yep. That, yeah, and that's I really good that, for that like light, you know, mm-hmm. going from dark to light with the... It the, is. Yeah, it's really good. Mm-hmm. Best low-budget cycling kits? I'm new to cycling in grad school and have no money from Katie. Oh, sponsor plug, the black bibs. <laughs> I was going to, yeah, you yeah, might uh, $40, just like unbranded, unlogoed, just like wonderful bibs, 40 bucks. Yeah. It's incredible. I was going to say, you can usually find, um, for like the smaller brands that are not like the brands that you see in the pro Peloton. That's usually like a good, <clears throat> if you see a brand in the pro Peloton, probably not a brand to go for in terms of like, they're probably not going to have something cheap and good. A lot of the time, the cheaper stuff is very much cheap, but with a brand like that, um, you could find some good stuff. LEL is another brand hyper threads, DNA, that sort of stuff. They have like kits that are non-custom that can be pretty cheap and high quality. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. What's the minimum cadence you're willing to do before switching from big ring to small? <laughs> <laughs> Probably about uh, 70, 70 seated, 50 standing. Hmm. I'm That's 75. 75, I think is where I draw the line if I'm seated. I'm more of a spinner, but then like standing, I'm ter- like, I'll, I'll, I won't shift till I'm at like 30. Probably I'm, I'm kind of dense that way. <laughs> I'll just, I'm standing. There's no rules anymore. Okay. Elite tax or specialized bottles. Specialized. Oh, specialized. Like Biden's are cool, but like, yeah. When you're trying to really get a bunch of food <laughs> in there. Are they there? Bidens or like President Biden or are they bidons? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> They're Joe. Can somebody please make that? Okay, that needs to happen. <laughs> somebody needs to make a bottle with Joe Biden's face on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gold. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> Elite makes like a super light one. Um, they do not last well, especially if you like wash them in the dishwasher, they tend to warp, but they're really, really light and you can squeeze so much water out of them so Mm. fast. Like Mm. they almost feel disposable, which is concerning. And I know the pro Peloton usually uses bottles like they're disposable, which is ick and not good. Um, but yeah, that those elites are very good, but they're, I don't know. They don't really, and they also leak at the top when you squeeze them, you can get a lot of water out, but if you squeeze too hard, it just starts pouring out of the cap. Interface. Is it really things. pronounced beat on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Ivy, right. since we're pre-recording, do you want us to cut this I've out? I've been racing my bike <laughs> no. for 13 years. Do not cut this out. No one oh my <laughs> Biden. <laughs> Biden. <laughs> Biden. <laughs> Grandpa Joe. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> which podcast host will wear the wackiest outfit to the Met Gala, and why is it Thor? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can see Pete wearing something crazy. Oh. I don't know. Um, I'm disappointed with the Met Gala. Okay, yeah, love fashion. I'm disappointed with what people came came up with. Um, like the theme enough. was yeah, like America. Like there were no. Is it called nudie suits? The like super bedazzled like cowboy jackets and suits. Like oh, yeah, no, you know, den- if, like if there all was these a lack men of out denim, there, that's a problem. Yeah, all these men out there wearing like regular tuxedos like nobody did like a zoot suit like you know there were all these like moments in american fashion that were not represented so therefore i'm gonna i would wild out i would have gone wild with it i think ivy would be the one for sure i think ivy would would represent 
If you're <laughs> as, as frustrated about the Met Gala's lack of American reference and fashion, uh, please let us know in the comments uh, if you're as frustrated <laughs> as Ivy. <laughs> so then Ivy can commiserate. <laughs> All right. Uh, last one from Rapid Fire. Wearing cycling sunglasses when off the bike. Okay or obnoxious? Just unacceptable. Completely unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends. I mean, it, it, yeah, I, yeah. So I have prescription uh, Rokas that I just mm-hmm. got, and we went to the wrong trailhead, so we had to get back in the car and go to the other trailhead, and I had to wear them in the car for just about a five minute drive, and I, Amorette couldn't look at me. And I, yeah. I just, any motorist yeah. that passed, I kind of tried to hide my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like I, very I'm, bro. Very bro. There's, there's some. I feel like I should be are, towing a boat. <laughs> 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 yeah. There's some that are okay. I think the Oakley Sutro kind of walks the line, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A bit. That you works. Know? Yes. I could see that. Yeah. Um, this is relevant. Yeah. Because I'm like, no, seriously, because I'm packing yeah. for this like huge race block and like I really like to mm-hmm. pack light and I don't want to take a lot of extra stuff. And like I already need to take like a few sets of sutras with like different lenses. And it was like, I don't want to also take casual glasses for like 30 mm-hmm. minute car trips. Like this is ridiculous. So I'm going to, I'm going to just do it. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to wear sutras. That's, as a, casual. that's a flexible style though. If it's something that just. Yep screams I'm a bike racer you can't wear that jawbreakers you have a helmet on. yeah, yeah. yeah. People wear exactly jawbreakers like <laughs> yeah. to me I'm just like oh gosh like what are we doing here yeah yeah it's too much <laughs> you gotta like look it, like it, you're it, ready to go from Trader Joe's just right onto a jet ski and yeah. just and, and, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always worried that if I like if if those people like touch those glasses wrong that they're gonna transform on their face it's like something's gonna happen you know what I mean like <laughs> arms are gonna flip out and I don't know what the deal is so so, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I like simplified su- uh, sunglasses. I, I just got some from a friend of mine. He started up a company and they're great for cycling, but I'm not sure I would want to wear them off the bike either. You know, they're more performance oriented. So yeah, you got to, what's that walk the line. What's uh, Finn, uh, Finn, yeah. F-I-N-N. So far I'm liking cool. them. Yeah. They're, they're, um, I don't get dry eyes, which is nice because with the Sutros, they're too, they kind of. Mm-hmm. The, the, they they kind of sit far away from my face or something. I'm not sure, but I can get like dry eyes if it's like a descent or something like that. The wind. Oh, you need kinda. you need the Sutro S. I started writing those instead. Better, a little bit smaller like one. smaller and like fit closer to my face. And yeah, yeah, yeah good call. Uh, okay, from Barnaby, uh, which fantastic. I wish that that name could come back in fashion too these <laughs> days. Uh, maybe maybe it is, and I'm totally unaware. Um, awesome name. I've been training for a criterium series with the intention of being the last lead out guy, but thanks to an untimely collision, my sprinter is hospitalized and I've been promoted to sprinter. The first race is in eight days, which we were going to cover this question last week, but we didn't have time. So chances are Barnaby already went through this. So this is probably very useless for you, Barnaby, but just the same, maybe we can all learn from this. It's always <laughs> next year, Barnaby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he says, what can I do in the last week to improve my max effort sprints? I've been doing the rolling road race plan, assuming that I'd need to be uh, needing or uh, holding power for our up to a lap before the sprint being this last person in the lead out train. Um, so yeah, Chad, uh, what can you do in the last week to make his sprint better? Or actually Ivy, mm-hmm. why don't you take this one first? What do you think? Oh, sure. I mean, I think that the important parts that they'll need to finish, um, as a sprinter are already there. If you've like worked on the ability to be mm-hmm. in the front of the race in those like critical moments and high pressure moments and navigating a field when the pressure's on and the pace is high, then like, if you, if you feel confident in those things, then like the, the mechanics of being there as a sprinter in the last parts of the race are already there. Um, especially in a criterium. Like if you can be at the pointy end of a race as a final lead out person in the last couple laps, like you're, you have what you need to be at the pointy end as a sprinter also. Um, so, I mean, that doesn't, so yeah, I guess my advice would be less to focus on the mechanics of sprinting themselves. I think those things are less important than, finding the right position and being in the right spot. Um, and mm-hmm. if you like, if you're in the right wheel and like, can't even get out of the saddle, it might still be okay. You know, yeah. that's a good point. <laughs> Depending upon the course. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What do you say, Chad? Well, Barnaby, I think you more than anybody else in that field are 
primed for, for having the best crack at this other than, well, say for the other sprinters who are designated sprinters and still have their whole lead out train, assuming their lead out train stays intact, but you know, everything you have to do. So now instead of dropping someone off, you're getting dropped off and you have to make that last surge. So everything's in place. I wouldn't overthink it. I hope you didn't. Um, but in terms of uh, in force improvements, and I could be wrong, but I don't think so. They turn around pretty quickly. And you're talking about eight days out. I don't know if they turn around that quickly, but they might. But we've talked many times about how big gear stomps are are, are important in increasing neural recruitment. So you want more fibers, you have to really drive the pedals down. And that standing start that we talked about earlier, this is the same idea. Dump it into a big, big gear, slow your roll to just barely turning over the pedals, stand and get on it as hard as you can. That's the most f- force you're ever going to incur when you're, when you're riding a bike. And those little bumps in force output capability can be the difference between uh, a snappy jump and kind of a lethargic one, assuming you get your gearing right. And uh, if your leg speed's good, then you just have to get on top of that gear. Coming off of a lead out, however, is the one thing that's going to be unfamiliar to you, right? Before it was just work until you're empty and then get out of the way. Now you have to spring. So you have to save a bit, which means your positioning is super crucial. You have to stick to the wheel that's in front of you. Otherwise, you're going to hemorrhage that that creatine phosphate that you absolutely need in the moment. And that stuff doesn't restore on the fly. So you have to maximize its utility by not wasting it, by being out of position. Mm. And I would say that with a week, everybody could improve their sprint in a week just in terms of coordination. Uh, mm. uh, and that's a big thing too, is uh, since we don't practice sprinting all the time, us non-sprinter people, uh, a little bit of work goes a really long way. It makes big improvements really quickly. Uh, and you'll be able to, yes, hit higher power, do all that stuff if you have the proper technique and coordination. So uh, I completely agree with and just add on to what everybody else has said with that. Uh, some more time just spent on making sure that you're doing the right things with your body, uh, can, can really have quick improvements. So uh, I really hope it went well for you, Barnaby. Hopefully let us know. <laughs> I'm curious to hear. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Chris, Chris said, would there be any benefit to pre-exhausting the fast twitch fibers with a few reps of heavy deadlifts immediately prior to a sweet spot trainer road workout? <clears throat> I'm wondering if it would better simulate the leg fatigue of those longer endurance rides for those of us who are time crunched. Thanks again for giving us the best tools to train so we can stay competitive while balancing the responsibilities of everyday life. Yeah. Our pleasure, Chris. That's what it's all about. What do, what do you think about this, Chad? It's a, it's a complex topic. Uh, there's, there's one end of things that, uh, refer or ties into post activation potentiation, which is kind of basically prepping the muscle fibers for something that's going to happen. So if you were going to do like a, just a sprint, you would head up a hill at, at a low force requirement. And then by the time you got to the top of the hill, unleash your sprint. Um, there might be a time delay in there too, but, but there is a, a physiologic process or going on that happens when you kind of wake up the fibers before you plan to really utilize them. So that's one end of it. The other end of it is you're cooking fibers that you're not going to really use in a sweet spot workout. So these high twitch fibers or these fast twitch fibers, unless you've really run down your slow twitch, which is highly unlikely, they're going to be doing the majority of the work, the medium twitch kind of come into play, but the fibers that you're going to cook with heavy deadlifts probably aren't even going to be called upon. So it's uh, kind of not to imply you're a fool, but it sounds like a fool's errand to me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the whole fiber type, uh, or the, those transitional fibers, I can't think of the exact term. Um, but the, that I've seen stretched further than the reality, right. In the sense that people think that like, you know, you can take something that is predominant, like absolutely fast twitch and just instantly, you know, uh, sure. And there's transition. nothing wrong with the, the warm up, the priming sprints that people do the little five to 10 seconds and remind yourself remind your legs how to move quickly to remind the whole fiber spectrum or as much of it as you're going to recruit in a sprint that they will need to be active in the near future. I I do think there's absolutely some, some validity to that, but deadlifts, I mean, we're talking a very slow movement with a very high force requirement. That's not going to carry to really anything outside of maybe a standing start again. And and even then won't match it. What about like low cadence sustained intervals? You know, like we're talking like three by 20, four by 20 of like, you know, tempo stuff, but where you're just grinding away at like 55 sure. RPM. I think it's the same thing. I, th- I still don't think you're going to push into that upper realm of recruitment where you're getting the true sprint fibers, the fast switch fibers. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, on a sweet spot workout. Yeah. I yes, agreed. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and we are unanimous. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, this next one from Tim. My question is about the mental part of training during really hard efforts. Uh, Ivy, this one I want uh, <clears throat> I want your opinion on specifically. It says, where do successful athletes, and I'm going to define successful athletes uh, for all of us as, so this is our definition. And Tim, I don't know if this is your definition, but a successful athlete doesn't mean a professional athlete. It doesn't mean an athlete that um, <clears throat> wins or anything else like that. It means an athlete who is, who is getting improvement. Okay. So that's the definition that I will apply to this for this conversation. Where do successful athletes let their mind go when doing really high long efforts? I think he means like higher intensity, long efforts on long climbs, TTs and the like, do they stay in the moment thinking about the pain, concentrate on breathing, trying to feel the working muscle groups, trying to hold a good form or do they pull their mind out and start thinking about what to buy their spouse for the anniversary present if they haven't missed it already? <laughs> Strangely specific, Tim. <clears throat> uh, get on that. He says, for me in a race, it is easy to stay mentally engaged because I'm thinking about strategy, pace, competitors, fatigue level, and such. But training is a different animal. For me, I seem to climb as good, maybe even better if I'm daydreaming. <clears throat> Forgive me. At least my Strava segment times are fairly consistent. Would I get more out of my efforts when I'm training if I concentrated on the task at hand more? He says, I know Trainer Row primarily deals with, the phys- deals with the physical adaptation of training, but I thought I would throw this one out there, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this mental part of the training performance. Love your podcast and keep up the work from Tim. <clears throat> Ivy, what, what, would, what would you say to this one about, like, uh, do you try to control your headspace and kind of drive it in specific spots, or do you let it go when you're talking about training on these hard efforts or these long efforts. Yeah. Well, I mean, now revisiting what Tim wrote, I think that if their efforts are better when they like disassociate and think about something else, um, maybe it means that they don't really love to lean into that effort. And so, you know, um, or maybe they're like uncomfortable with the effort being uncomfortable. And in a race scenario, when there's like an immediate reward, that they can fixate on or think about to motivate them, they're able to lean into that effort more. But when that's not there, um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess like for me, apart from racing, my mind goes to just like loving that process of training and the training being difficult. And I mean, I feel like there are times when I haven't had races in the immediate future, like base training and like that super early season stuff when you're coming out of an off season, when everything like hurts and it's easy to be discouraged, learning to like love that process of it being difficult and painful and knowing what's on the other side of that has, I guess, changed my mentality for what those really hard efforts look like, like short or long or, or climbs or, you know, all the like, um, makes it feel, uh, more manageable and, um, I don't have to like distract myself or pretend it doesn't hurt because I really lean into enjoying that it does hurt. And that is part of the process. Mm. What do you, uh, how about you, Chad? Great thoughts. Ivy. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. It, it, totally in line with, with what I know. And that it's a, a difference between a, an associative versus dissociative approach. And, and I always push the associative approach in the, in the workout text because I want people to familiarize yourself themselves with, With what it feels like, I don't want to practice avoidance in a scenario where focusing on the work you're you're doing requires a high level of concentration, and that means you have to focus on. You don't necessarily need to give all your attention to the discomfort, but you can't ignore it. So I think there's a lot of value that comes with associating the discomfort with the effort level. I do recognize that there's a subjectivity to it too, though. If, if it makes it more repeatable, if it makes it more likely that you'll do the workout, get through the workout, do all your intervals, if you can dissociate in the ways. I mean, I've talked many times, even up to Sweet Spot Realm, I'm reading Bike Race on Mute, classical music. I mean, it's all going on. So you can't say that I am an associative personality. I don't sit there and just focus on keeping this high quality and it hurts so bad, but I'm going to get faster now I'm doing a hundred other things to distract myself from, but there is still a component or an aspect or you know, part of me that's focused on the work. So I recognize the merit on both sides of that and, and you know, no science whatsoever. 
simply anecdotal. I th- think you have to figure out what balance you need to strike. Mine's purely tied, almost like it's tightly tied to intensity. If intensity goes up, then my I become more associative in terms of my focus. I focus much more on the effort. Um, when I'm using Trainer Road, a lot of the time I just stare at cadence. Strangely, so I, I don't use erg mode, um, and I'll just be on the rollers. And I find that you know, since my resistance is set in that regard, I just need to hold my cadence at wherever the power target where it aligns with the power target. So if it's 89 or if it's 92, I just focus on that. And and I'm seriously, even though this is creepy, I just stare directly. Like I stare into that number <clears throat> and <clears throat> that's what helps me when it's really tough, um, is to focus more on it. <clears throat> Forgive me. Um, race cough from last night's, uh, hard workout. Uh, but I do find that when it's lower intensity or if it's really long and it's not high intensity, yeah. Like that's why I love, um, like doing outside workouts. Uh, we live in a beautiful area and get to go on these, you know, the, these cool roads where I can look at great views and that sort of stuff is huge for me. It's really motivational and really like healthy for me. Um, so, uh, I derive a lot of that, but I would also agree with almost, uh, almost everybody that I know that's uh, a pro athlete or a successful athlete in any way that you want to deem it. They'll do that. They may bring in music, but the music is less about dissociation. It's more about focus. It like enhances the focus. It helps them get even more into the moment many times. So it's like, you know, it's motivational music. It's, uh, it's something that really drives you and, and, and kind of brings you into it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I do. Yeah, Chad. I do want to mention that, that there is a fatigue component and I'm sure scientifically in, in terms of the research literature, this can be backed up, but I'm not going to go there right now. Rather, just say that I've done uh, – so when I, ha- I do those workouts with all the inputs, I can't mm-hmm. always accommodate that. I don't always have the bandwidth for it. So what I bring into that workout may mean that I can't do all those things on that day and I'm just going to read in silence while I ride, whatever. But to translate this to kind of what Jonathan was describing, which is what uh, triggered this, I-, I did a ride that I've done a few times up here in Spokane yesterday – and I was pinned. I was working hard. I was a little gassed going into it. I'm letting myself do every other day workouts, trying to figure out what I can and cannot tolerate. And I had too many other things on my mind to even appreciate my surroundings. Whereas every other time I've done that ride, I'm just awestruck by how beautiful a particular valley is or this little river that I'm crossing over or following along. I can process all that, but yesterday I was limited. I was focused on other things. So I I couldn't have dealt with other inputs, uh, which which leads me to believe that, you know, whatever I'm carrying into it, whatever my motivation is on the day, whatever else I'm dealing with in terms of an an injury, uh, I've only got so much to dedicate to working hard, associating, dissociating all the Mm -hmm. things. Yeah. You hit like a point of diminishing returns for sure. It's kind of what I'm worried about with Cape Epic. Like, it's such a unique experience and such a cool experience and I don't want to miss it, but I know that I'm going to be so deep in the box. Like it's just going to be so like, yeah, you know what I mean? Fall off you. Like mm-hmm. I, I could be on the surface of Mars. I, it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> like I, I could have like wildebeest running right next to me and I won't even notice. That's what I'm worried about, you know, just not noticing anything. So it's tough. Um, but yeah, I, I would think that Tim, uh, you have to do what works for you and what you feel is needed. I think that in that res- in that sense, I bet everybody is pretty good at self guiding themselves in terms of what sort of stimuli or level of focus that they need to be able to bring that. I mean, that's part of the reason why we don't even uh, with, with Trainer Road why we've uh, taken the path that we've taken in terms of uh, you know building a system that allows you to bring your own entertainment because we know that you know what you need best, right? So. Um, I think that it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's designed even around that. So, um, yeah, uh, d- uh, Ivy, uh, does anybody, or Chad, do you have anything else that you want to add? No. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, this yes, is, I agree. Fun- <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> and, and, and that somebody needs to make these grandpa Joe A buttons. Quick- <laughs> <laughs> Please do it. <laughs> we need them. I will oh, buy those no. bottles. Um, yeah, maybe one of our designers. We have a creative day coming Stimulates up. Stimulates the economy. <laughs> Helps everybody. I'm never going to look at a water bottle it's the same nobody. way. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, no. 
We have Creative Day coming up. I think an illustrator here at Trader Road, that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be a great Creative Day project. So um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. If you're on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. That will make it so this video will get put into other cyclist feeds. So then we'll be able to make more people faster, uh, help the world. When the world is a faster place, it's a better place. It's a healthier place. It's a happier place. That's really what we do, uh, why we do all that we do here. So do that, please. Share the podcast with your friends and go to trainerroad.com and sign up and get ready for whatever big goals that you have uh, to prep for all throughout this off season and base season. It's exciting times. So thanks a bunch, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.